to the first of our speakers today. Um, sorry, my screen's gone a bit. It's not liking my double screen anymore. There we go. Right then. So can I hand over, please? Great. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, hi, all. I'm Ped. Uh, I'm from Feed in Bristol. And uh, we work with, uh, well, uh, a number of organisations around the city um, to tackle issues around food inequality and, and food justice. And we work uh, very closely with the City Council and the public health team in, in Bristol in particular. Um, and we've created the One City Food Equality Strategy, um, which I'm going to run you through some some points around the issues in, in Bristol and um, and how we approach the the how we tackle the issues here. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Jeannie? Also, I forget kind of how long we're meant to have here, so do shout to me if I'm going over. Yeah, we've got about five, five to ten minutes. OK, great. Um, so, um, so first of all, uh, how do we approach food inequality or understanding about food inequality, food insecurity in the city? I think it's it's important to recognise that it is a um, it is a a bigger picture is that you can't just tackle food on its own in isolation of you know food poverty for example is it's part of wider poverty issues so we need to be very aware of that it is a it is a uh, a systems approach that is needed uh, as there are a lot of complex factors that that feed into um people and how they're um uh, how they're experiencing poverty and and the um the issues that come with that and and here are some of the the issues that we highlight in in the food equality strategy and action plan, which is looking at some of the economic, social, and environmental issues, so you can see things like um, you know welfare provision, uh, skills and knowledge, uh, access to food in your area, food support in your area, culturally appropriate food that that is relevant to your dietary appropriate food that you need, um, and and also like kind of the wider issues around the food system, what's being in the food in the supermarkets, what's coming through the surplus food system, um, so food supply chain. Uh, availability of food within the area with um with regards to shops and green races etc there's, there's a number of complex issues um that all that all work together um that create some that, that go towards creating some of the issues that people experience uh so can we go on to the next slide please um so so what kind of this does this look like uh in bristol or what an idea give you guys an idea of the problem in bristol that we that we're facing um so according to the last quality of life survey we have approximately 8.1 percent one in 12 households that reported um experiencing moderate to, to severe insecurity in the city uh in some of the wards where we have you know rank highest on the indices of multiple deprivation where where food insecurity food inequality um is is quite prevalent we see that rise to approximately um one in six households um that support that report severe food in in equality insecurity uh and one in four that report either moderate or severe uh, inequality so um so we can see that there's there can be a the, there's a vast difference in, in the areas that that are really suffering um in some of the deprived areas in, in bristol compared to some of uh, some of the, the 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 stats for the for the overall city or or in some of the more affluent areas it's also really important to recognize that different groups certain groups will experience um food insecurity as well and in, in and report higher higher numbers of food insecurity and, and will have different experiences uh around food insecurity and that's that's quite important to to recognize because how you tailor provision how you tailor support will very much depend on on who you're speaking to and the experience that they have and the, and the problems that they're facing around food um so next slide please Thank you. So, uh, so what is food in a what is food equality? So, this is this is the definition that, that we created in Bristol. This was based upon um, over eighty organisations around the city that are working in this sector, uh, coming together and talking about what they want to see around food equality. And and we all agreed uh, on this definition, which is that food equality exists when all people at all times have access to nutritious, affordable, and appropriate food according to their social, cultural, and dietary needs. They are equipped with the resources, skills, and knowledge to use and benefit from food which is sourced from a resilient, fair and environmentally sustainable food system. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this is part of and the base forms the basis of our, our food equality strategy and action plan. Um, this strategy and action plan is part of the bigger work in, in Bristol um, around the Good Food 2030 plan and, and part of the legacy work from the um, Sustainable Food City Gold Award that, that we received uh, well, a couple of years ago now. 
Uh, and, and inside this strategy, and, and again, this was all done within consultation with organizations around the city. Like I said, over 80, over 80 organizations fed into this process. Um, we created five priority themes uh, which focus on fair and equitable access, which are looking at choice and security, saying that everybody in the city needs to have, um, you know, both the, both the dignity of choice of food that they are accessing as well as um, as well as security of knowing where their, their next meal is going to come from um, that everybody should have access to skills and resources that they need to to access food to, to use food that they have access to um, so making sure that we have equitable um, education and um, resources available so that includes both community resources as well as resources within the, your own homes in Bristol um, that we that the sustainable and local food system needs to be thought of in in that much wider way of, of those that um that struggle to access food that are experiencing food insecurity are also able to access local food and how we kind of bridge that gap between local ethically produced food within a local system um and actually it not just being perhaps for um the middle classes that live in clifton or or, or redland and actually how do we make sure that that sustainable local food system is accessible for everybody uh and that there is uh importance that food is at the heart of decision making and and this is kind of looking at the the wider city picture what's happening in, in local government, what's happening in local authority, what are the decisions they're making, what, when they're looking at housing, when they're looking at parks and green spaces, allotment strategies, transport strategies, where does food to sit into that? Are we having the wider conversation to make sure that food is being thought of within all these different spaces? So it's, it's part of our remit and the public health team's remit or part of the public health team remit that work with us on this to, to ensure that that is being represented in those conversations. Um, next slide, please. So that was that was the strategy. We then um, created the action plan, which was a three year action plan. The idea that it was a three year action plan to go with the 10 year strategy being that um, it's a constantly evolving space. So we didn't want to write a 10 year strategy, uh, a 10 year action plan, apologies. Um, that, that might go out of date in a couple of years. You know, we've seen the last three years alone, there's been a lot of a lot of issues that we probably didn't see coming around the pandemic, around the cost of living crisis, wars that, that have an impact on this as well. So, so it's important to, um, we felt it was important to write a shorter term plan and we'll renew that plan every three years uh, as part of the strategy work. And and in that, the, the strategy was created in the same process as, the, uh, sorry, the action plan was created in the same process as the strategy. And that involved um, consulting with lots of people with, with lived experience of food inequality, as well as organizations that were working with people that were experiencing food inequality. And from that, we created, um, we distilled all the thousand act plus actions that we were given um, into, into all the different priority areas. And they kind of broadly go into areas where we have actions that have already started in the city. So things that are happening that are having a positive impact that can be, um, that are ready to be expanded standard. Um, we have actions that need to be taken by 2026 to start laying the foundation for, for some of the, the strategy outcomes that we want to see. Um, and, uh, and, and some ideas for new actions or projects that need to be piloted before 2026 to again look at things like you know food uh, locally led food justice networks um, or um, cooperative buying schemes etc that we can start to trial see if they have a positive impact and, and then we can look to expand those further down the line as well a really important part of this as well and, and where I talk when we talk about the actions that have already started is, is that there's a lot of great work already going on this isn't about reinventing the wheel and it's certainly about making sure that those organizations that are doing fantastic work already in the city uh, are getting the credit that they they deserve for that work as well and, and how we can really make sure that their work is being recognized and being expanded and supported uh, next slide please uh, so here we've just got uh, a few links um, that you can that you can go to. I don't know if the slides will get sent around. I can't remember, Jeannie, if you said so. Um, but there's a link to our website. There's a link to the strategy page at the um, on the One City page. Um, there is um, a link to the action plan on our website as well. And there's also uh, a support in Bristol page that we've got on our website. Now this support in Bristol page looks at um, different areas of food support that you can get in the city. That includes lists of um, organizations in different parts of the city that are providing food provision or food support in one way or another, as well as um, uh, the food, uh, the cash first leaflets that we um, that we've supported to happen in Bristol. Um, and that's uh, kind of like that approach of if you're worrying about money, what you can do. Um, and we've had that translated into seven different languages. Uh, there's an online version you can get on download on our website for the seven different languages, as well as um, as well as the physical ones that we have uh, in the office that we can deliver to you as well. Uh, so I think that's everything that I'm going to do now. And I'm going to pass over to North Somerset, I believe. 
Yes, thanks very much. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, I'm Liz Green. Um, I work in the public health team in North Somerset Council. So I'm going to provide a bit of an overview of the work in relation to food security in North Somerset. And then Sophie will follow on to cover South Gloucestershire after this. Great. Thank you. Um, so firstly, just to provide a bit of data on how food insecurity affects people in North Somerset. So the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities um, tells us that almost one in 10 people suffer from food insecurity. So in terms of how many people this represents in North Somerset, so it's approximately 19,198 people who experienced food insecurity to some degree in 2021. Um, and looking at the detail from the Local Government Association, um, they report that in 2021, 3% of households experienced hunger, 8.1% struggled with food insecurity, and 97 worried about having access to food. So as you can see, and as we all know, um, this is a real problem for us in North Somerset, as it is in, in other areas. Can we move to the next slide, please? Great. So in terms of the numbers of food parcels distributed by the Trussell Trust Food Bank, so between April 2022 and March this year, in total, 16,221 parcels were distributed, um, of which 6,705 of those were to children. Um, and this was across eight of their distribution centres. So moving on to the next. Great. Thank you. So just to explain then what action is being taken in North Somerset based on this identified problem affecting almost 10 percent of our population here in North Somerset. Um, so the North Somerset Food Resilience Alliance was established. So this was following the government's 2021 um, national food strategy. Um, the alliance aims to strengthen those links between um, food programmes, so to enhance access to, um, to food, to food clubs, to food banks um, and other related services. Um, so it, it, it built on the success really of all the great work that, um, that lots of community groups established during the pandemic. Um, and so currently we've got 55 partners who are part of the Food Alliance group. Um, and so from the Collaborative Food Alliance work. We're in, currently in the process of developing a food quality strategy. Um, so with input from many stakeholders across North Somerset. Um, this, the consultation process as part of this has involved lots of community conversations um, with lots of individuals um, and groups. Um, and we're developing an action plan um, from this work, which is based on the food resilience pathway which I'll just outline on the next slide. So this is the food resilience pathway that we're using in North Somerset, which is um, the, the model that we're using to base the, the strategy on. So it demonstrates the move from the shorter term support towards the longer term or more sustainable support. So where people can have that more independence. Um, so addressing firstly, um, easing crisis, so ensuring people have access to safe, healthy food, um, making sure we address the needs of individuals and families who are in crisis. So it's that emergency food provision, so essentially immediate short term support. And then the enabling stability. So this part of the pathway starts to build a little bit more um, and think about longer term food support systems. Um, empowering regeneration. So again, this is more um, longer term access to local food. Um, so things like growing um, and cooking skill development. And then engagement for change. So this aspect is about the food policy um, and strategies um, across all the stakeholder groups. Um, and this is what we're aiming for really in our action plan is to sort of build in those goals towards um, ensuring people have a more sustainable way of accessing that affordable, the healthy and the nutritious food. So then just looking at um, easing crisis, really. So this is our list of food banks, food clubs, um, community fridges. Um, 
it's not an exhaustive list because we're still working on um, mapping out all the support that's available in North Somerset um, as part of the work on the strategy and action plan. Excellent, great, thanks Jeannie. Um, so in terms of practical help, so um, obviously if we can identify those people experiencing or at risk of food insecurity, then we can target that support most appropriately and they can be connected with with the services to help address um, perhaps some of the causes of their food insecurity um, like poverty and low income and then support people to prevent or mitigate the adverse impacts um, on both their mental and, and physical health. So just at the top there um, we've got worrying about money um, so this is quite probably um, people may be familiar with it it's a practical leaflet that helps find options um, and places to get help. So it's like a step-by-step -step process after answering a few questions. Um, there's things like cooking classes. So across North Somerset, there's a number of different cooking classes that people can access. So some for children and young people, adults, um, including refugee and um, asylum seeking communities as well. So then there's the free school meals, holiday activity and food, sorry, um, and healthy start scheme. Um, so I guess it's just about ensuring that people are aware of those national schemes that they may be entitled to. Um, and there's links for those um, three schemes in, in North Somerset there. There's things like Meals on Wheels. Um, so there's a number of food delivery services um, who provide meals to older and unwell people who might have difficulty preparing food. Um, the allotments, um, lots of food growing cooperatives um, are across North Somerset. Um, Trussell Trust, again, we mentioned the food banks um, and also they have a financial support worker um, working within the organisation as well. There's community fridges, I mentioned on a previous slide, and affordable food clubs. So it, really in response to the need, these schemes seem to be growing um, across North Somerset to support this fairer access to food. Um, there's things like lunch clubs, um, we've got an, a North Somerset online directory, which has a list of, of all these lunch clubs that people can access. Things like surplus food schemes, making sure food doesn't go to waste. Um, and local businesses like restaurants have got involved to help as well. One example there is um, where Papa Dom's in Weston provide multiple meals where people have been struggling um, for food, which has been fantastic. Um, our community food grant. So this is a, um, a grant scheme that aims to support projects to encourage healthy eating, um, as well as improved food skills um, and growing skills. And then just at the bottom there, so employability skills and training support. So there's a portal there which um, signposts support um, so that so that to, to support people to work um, and be able to support themselves and their families whilst whilst doing so. Thanks. So just lastly, really, there's a few additional useful, hopefully useful links to refer people to in, in North Somerset. Just on the slide, there's the Better Health website, which is our go to website, really, for all health related information. Um, so including all those wider influences on health, like cost of living. Um, and there's a link there to Feeding Britain and, and Cash First as well. And then just what's coming next is under sort of development at the moment is our comprehensive um, food support map for North Somerset. So this is where all the food offers will be able to be viewed clearly on a map of the area. Um, and we'll be adding that to the Better Health website um, once that's ready. I'll stop there, but thank you for listening. And if you are interested in um, what we're doing in North Somerset, please get in touch. My email address was on that the previous slide. Um, and my colleague also um, would be happy to hear from people if people are interested in the food resilience pathway specifically. Thanks. Thank I'll, I'll, ha I'll hand over. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sophie Dalton. So, yeah, I'm from South Gloss. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm coming at things from a slightly different angle because um, I'm actually work in financial security. So I'm just thinking about financial security and how that affects everything and how food insecurity kind of feeds into um, into into financial security as lots of things do. Um, 
so we are currently developing a financial security framework um, in South Coast at the moment. Um, and one of the main things we're thinking about in that is food and food aid, um, as long as you know, along with lots of other things like sustainable employment and all those kinds of things. So that is in the pipeline um, and coming along, but a bit too early to kind of discuss today, I'm afraid at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to talk about kind of the work we are currently doing um, and give a bit of an overview of that. Um, so if you could go on the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Um, so here I've just got um, so financial security in the middle, which is my kind of main um, main role. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the other wider determinants around it that kind of lead into that. And if we go on to the next slide, we can see um, food insecurity is obviously one of those. Um, and as kind of people have mentioned, um, there's lots of other aspects that lead to people being um, food insecure. Um, so things like not being able to travel to bigger supermarkets and having to rely on corner shops. Um, having um medical issues that mean they need you know certain they can only have certain foods or they um, will only eat certain things um lots of you know um low-income families and single parent families got responsibilities which means they work lots or they you know need to rely on very quick easy meals or don't have the time to cook them unfortunately at the moment energy bills are very high as well so we've spoken to quite a lot of families that just can't afford to put on their ovens and you know cook cook things in that way as well so as you know lots of different things affecting lots of different families we're also talking to lots of different families that all these things are affecting and unfortunately they're just not on the threshold to get um benefit so on, not entitled to free school meals healthy start those kind of things but obviously still experiencing all these things and looking for other avenues um for support um next slide please um, so, yeah, one of the things we've done is we've created our financial um, local and financial support leaflet that you can see on the left, um, which um, is what part of our um, comprehensive approach to support. So we're trying to cover all bases, as lots of other people already talked about as well. Um, so one of the pages, as you can see, is getting enough food to eat. Um, we've also got a page about finances, employability, um, housing and those kinds of things. This is one of the key documents that we're kind of using as a signposting tool. Um, it's really useful and we have got copies of those if anybody would like them. And at the top, there is the online version of that leaflet as well, which has all the links to all those different places, um, which, yeah, it's been really useful for lots of people so that's been really positive um, and on the right you can see our financial security dashboard so this just gives a bit of an overview of what financial security looks like in South Gloss it includes sort of free school meals healthy start and those kinds of things so it says the eligibility and the uptake of those um, which is something that we're we're really trying to improve as well so yeah all these things trying to work towards moving away from the sticking plaster approach as lots of people have mentioned as well sort of you know we don't want to just give people a bit of money or a bit of food we want to be able to help them in other ways as well to for that long-term support next slide please um, another way we've been trying to help is giving out warm and cool packs. So last winter we did 428 warm packs and we've just done a thousand cool packs over the summer. So just trying to help people without not having to have their um, heating on or their fans on and ways to keep warm and cool. And there's lots of information in those packs as well about where they can go for support. Um, different versions of the bag for family, pensioners and adults. And we've been working with Age UK and 7Y to kind of deliver those. Currently in the process of making a thousand more of the warm packs as well, which will be going out in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, yes, just kind of another another way that we're trying to um, support people. Next slide, please. And we've also been working on, on our community spaces offer, which um, I know lots of councils have been doing. So this has been really positive for um, cool spaces over the summer and warm spaces in the winter um, and a lot of the spaces are offering free food a lot of places doing um, hot meals or um, parcels that you can take home they offer um, drinks uh, hot drinks and activities um, we've kind of found from the feedback we've had that even though going for the warmth is a very um, high priority on people's list more it's about um, the isolation people were feeling and somewhere to go and and also that food aspect um, that we've seen so yeah it's places that are offering the free, free meals are definitely um, having much more footfall than the others and fortunately we've had um, a fund that have been able to support the welcome spaces to offer these things including the free meals and things and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment next one please um, we've also been going out into the community, um, linking up with other as other um, departments within the council um, and just again, yeah, trying to reach people where they are and offer the support we've got. So we've been working with the food waste team, 
thinking about um, how people can cut down on food waste and obviously save money that way. Um, stop smoking and other health aspects that can save money as well. Vitamins and warm and well um, have been working with us on those. Um, yeah, just sharing key information. And we're currently working on some pension credit pop ups. So really focusing on the uptake of pension credit because that goes unclaimed and we know pensioners um, generally are very reluctant to take help um, but even though they are a lot of them are struggling with food and lots of other things so yeah, we're really trying to make sure they're getting everything they're entitled to. Next slide please. Um, so a bit about what's happening in South Gloss. Like I said, my main role isn't in food security, but um, a couple of colleagues have given me some key information. So I'm just going to give you a few bits about what's happening. Um, so the South Gloss Food Alliance um, is a network of small food aid organisations sharing practice, which is in negotiation at the moment due to staff changes. Um, but this focus is mainly on food um community food support, um, helping people after crisis. And again, like we said, moving away from that sticking plaster approach. So using food clubs instead of food banks where you can pay a couple of pounds to get um, some food and then that can go back into, into that community. Um, yeah, so lots of things going on with that and in negotiation at the moment. But as I said, we can, we're trying to feed all of this into the framework we're currently working on. Um, so that will hopefully come down the line. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to just work through the next couple because I'm very conscious of time. I think I've put too many things in um, to talk about. Um, but the, so we've got a free school meals task and finish team. So our, um, we know that 15.1% of pupils in South Gloucester are elig eligible for free school meals, but only 10.1% are actually up, um, taking that up. So we have um, a task and finish group who have tried to improve that, um, streamlining the process and um, really highlighting the benefits of what the, you know the school getting people premium money and the holiday clubs and things like that. So that has um, helped. But now they're kind of moving on to long more longer term approaches. Um, we know that there are so many different aspects, as I'm sure lots of you are aware, but it makes it very complex trying to work out the reasons for this. So it could be the perception that people have of what their children will experience in school or the you know food that's on offer, lots of different things. So they're kind of trying to work through that at the moment to try and increase that uptake. Um, and also the Healthy Start, Start scheme as well is being promoted because um, we're aware that there's um, lots of people missing out on financial and nutritional benefits of that scheme. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I'll just very briefly talk through this one. So like I said before, we've got some funds. So we've managed to give out some um, of our funds to the community welcome spaces via the Food Community Fund um, and the Welcome Spaces Fund. This is kind of from this year and last year we were able to give out about £30,000, I think, as well to, to fund and support the community welcome spaces. That's been really good. Um, the household support fund that we have as well has helped with free school meal support so in the holidays um we've been giving out the school vouchers and helping the um holiday um clubs as well and then directly in um to the residents for food is nearly twenty thousand pounds as well from april to october this year um so it's just a bit of information there about the half program so we've been seeing really positive uptake of those um unfortunately a lot of the children again we were seeing coming to them but bringing their own less nutritional food and not having the food on offer or coming and being very hungry so these are things that again we've been we're going to be thinking about going forward and just a few bits of information there about um the north bristol and south coast food bank so lots of outlets that we have um and lots of brilliant work that's been going on with food parcels um, and financial outcomes there with citizens advice thank you can i go to the next one um so i'm just going to very briefly talk about um sort of things that you can be doing when you're talking to people how you can support and I know I'm sort of South Gloss but I think a lot of these things will just generally apply across across the councils so asking people if they've registered for free school meals a lot of people um, are confused with the difference between like universal free school meals which is from reception to year two and don't think they need to apply but then they are missing out on those other benefits so it's kind of making sure they have that understanding um, directing people to our one-stop shops um, so they the officers there have a really great understanding of all these different causes of financial security and a really good knowledge of all the benefits and things that people can be eligible for so if you're unsure it's the best place to send them they are um, the fountain of knowledge <laughs> I think anyway um, and then having knowledge around the key support available so that you can direct people as well so I'm just going to very quickly talk about um, a couple of links if I can go to the next one please um, so maximising income, so like I said, making sure people are getting everything they're entitled to, benefits, free school meals, disability allowance, those kinds of things, which can obviously, if you can free up money for one thing, it can support food and all different other aspects. Um, 
potentially improving their opportunities through work and training um, through the Department of Work and Pensions, um, offering desk debt advice and potentially writing off debt. So there's a few um, places that can support with this, which is our leaflet in the finance section. And again, the one stop shop um, offices can help with that. Um, lots of um, pe pe residents that are on benefits are open to lots of offers as well on mobile phone, water tariffs, lots of different things. They can get discounts, which lots of people are unaware of. So are they utilising these to, to benefit um, and make the most of their income? Um, and applying for grants as the house, such as the household support fund. So this is the fund we have, which funds um, all of the half stuff I was talking about, um, the warm packs and those kinds of things. But it, you can also apply directly to get that money. It's not you don't have to be on benefits to apply for it. It's kind of done on a income and outgoings basis um, and very much on an individual um, circumstances um, case. So, yeah, we're encouraging people if they're unsure to just apply. And if they can't apply for I can't um, sorry if that aren't eligible for that, there could be other things that um, they might be eligible for. Next one, please. Um, so this is our just a little postcard that we have. We've given out to lots of places, which is Oh, that's okay. Um, just about getting enough to eat a few clean places. There's the QR code there as well for our one use site, which I <clears throat> sorry, briefly mentioned earlier as well. So there's lots of um, suggestions for food support on that site. Uh, next one, please. Um, and then the um, online version of the leaflet that I mentioned earlier, we've got the getting enough food to eat page. And on that page, we've got a list of community food groups, which we're constantly trying to add to. And on that page as well, there's also a mapping tool. Just a couple down, you can see it on the, the bit on the side, ma mapping tool, early help. And you can just click food support and um, it will narrow down the food. And you can zoom in on that area and see what food is available, um, what food support is available in that area. So you can put people in the right direction um, as well. Next one, please. Um, and then, yeah, finally, this is just our cost of living page. This is kind of the place where we put all the information for anything cost of living, anything financial security, anything food related, all those kinds of things are all um, all there in one place. So this is kind of the link we've been giving to people if they're not sure where to go. It's this one or the kind of online version of the leaflet or kind of what we're using for signposting. Um, and again, there's just some information there about the one stop shop. So you can give them a ring or pop in. Um, and or check on the website. Yes, there's loads of different things, um, loads of support available. And like I said, yeah, everything feeds in. So unfortunately, mine's not particularly food food orientated, but hopefully very helpful kind of with all the other aspects. Oh, sorry, aspects um, and everything that feeds into that. Um, yeah, and I'm obviously here later for questions. If there anything is there anything, and if people would like to contact me, I'm happy to put my email in the thing. I think that's it. Sorry Thanks if I've talked very fast. I don't tend to do that. No, <laughs> Thank no you. Thanks very much for that. Right, so we do have um, our colleague Liz did have to pop off the call slightly early. Um, oh, no, you're back. Sorry. I'm Hello. here. <laughs> Hi. Well, can I introduce you to talk about making every contact count then? Yeah, I will. Um, just really just a couple of minutes. So I'm I'm Liz Le Breton. Um, I'm senior public health specialist and work in public health in Bristol. So um, work very closely with with PEDS who presented at the beginning around the food equality work. Um, but I also um, and the main link in in Bristol um, for making every contact count. So we just thought it'd be a nice opportunity to um, highlight again if you've already heard about it and if you haven't, um, that it's still around and there's um, opportunities to um, um, take some training. So um, just to quickly give an overview. So making every contact count, um, an approach to behaviour change that supports staff to make the most of everyday interactions they have with people um, and recognising opportunities to talk to people using the skills of asking and listening. Um, and I'll mention the, the training that, that, that is available in a sec. Um, so MEC is aimed at everybody. It's not restricted to one person or professional organisation. It's sort of very um, sort of generic um, and it's a very brief behaviour change intervention. So it can be particularly useful for frontline um, staff, customer facing workers typically, who typically engage with people for a shorter period of time, like receptionists or community connectors, um, but also a really good basis for staff who work with people on more extended periods, such as health and social workers and um, um, staff like yourselves. Um, and it provides an excellent foundation and complements other training and coaching and, and mentoring and that type of thing. Next slide, please. 
Thanks. So the benefits of MEC, so it reports um, improvements in job satisfaction, increasing professional empathy, um, team bonding, um, positive effect on organisational culture. It can support people to take the first steps towards leading healthier lives, which has the potential to reduce demands on health and social care services. Um, and just offers a different way of interacting with people and to sort of help them um, sort of raise the issue of various different um, uh, topics. Um, so provide staff with different options, really. So there's the link on there for more information. And this is across BNSSG. Um, and I've also put the links for um, training at the moment. So there's e-learning that you can obviously do um, in your own time, um, various different e-learning e um, modules on MEC. But there's also um, MEC training, which is a three hour online course. Um, and they usually have dates. So this, this is actually run by South Gloucestershire Council um, and is usually uh, monthly so if you, you look on that date you can you can um pick a pick a date for that and then they're also looking for train the trainers for the mech training so um we do have a one day course in bnssg i'm really keen to look across um all the local authorities to find people who could can deliver that um, training. So um, we don't have any dates right at the minute, but if people are interested in that, um, do get in touch. Happy to be the contact for that um, if people are interested. OK, that, that's that's me. Thank I think I'm handing much. over to Louise. Yep. For the final bit of slides before the breakouts. Yeah. Thank you very much, Louise. <coughs> Hi, yeah. Um, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about three different things. I'm going to talk about who I am and what my experience is. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Shaping Places for Healthier Lives project, which is the hat I'm wearing in this meeting. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, different ways to understand food, food insecurity, different ways people can be food insecure and how that relates to your work as a social prescriber. So three different things. Um, <clears throat> item one, me, doesn't have any slides, it's just got my face. Um, I am Louise, I work for various different food organisations and I'm also training to be an occupational therapist, um, which is kind of relevant to your role. Um, I work in Bristol with Bristol Food Network doing the Bristol Good Food 2030 um, strategy, which I recommend you look up. Um, and in South Gloss, I used to be the person that ran the South Gloss Food Alliance and me becoming an occupational therapist is why there's been staff changes. Um, and I still work in South Gloss doing the Shaping Places for Healthier Lives project, which is this. Can I have the next slide? Next slide. Hey, brilliant. OK, so Shaping Places for Healthier Lives um, is a project that's running across ooh, three different areas. I think I'll tell you in a minute. Um, I'm based in the South Gloss bit. We're based in Patchway. And essentially, we're looking to start a new food project or projects um, based on what the residents of Patchway and various other organisations working in Patchway tell us that they want. So it's supposed to be as like a ground up approach to starting a new food project in an area that doesn't have any big food projects going on at the moment and is an area where people could potentially really benefit from that. Um, so yeah, these are all the things we're looking to do. Oh yeah, North Bristol, North Somerset, South Gloss, fantastic. Um, and yeah, we're gonna try out new ideas and hopefully come up with something that will be popular, engaged with and help people with their food. Next slide. Yeah, so this is, this is how it's going. These are the different areas. Um, yeah, and as it says there, we're looking to work quite closely with residents to make sure this is a project that they really will go to and they really will attend and they really will benefit from. Um, and to make sure that uh, it's something that is kind of specific to the needs of that area, because different areas tend to have different food needs. I know in Patchway, people struggle to access the shops because there's a massive motorway between people and the big shops um, and food in the area is quite expensive. So I'm working on things around that. I think that's all I'm going to say about shaping places for now, but happy to answer questions on it later. Um, and I'll go on to the next slide, which should be, yes, food insecurity. So <clears throat> um, these slides are based on some slides that I got from Megan Blake, who is a researcher based at the University of Sheffield. I really recommend you check out her work. She writes about food insecurity and food aid quite a lot. And she's got some really good and really useful ways of framing that 
that can be really relevant to your work as a social prescriber because they help you understand the different sort of shapes that food insecurity can take, which is something that Ped referenced earlier when he said that different groups of people and people in different areas can struggle to access food because of different reasons. Um, and the way that Megan Blake describes this is she describes the food ladders approach, um, which I'll talk about later. So next slide. Great. Um, so this is a list of six different ways that someone can be food insecure. Um, number one, the most obvious one, can't afford it. And I would say that with almost every way of being food insecure, if you have more money, you can usually overcome it. But that's not true of all ways. Like more money can't necessarily buy you um, friends to eat with or places locally to buy food, but it can resolve much problems. Um, so that's number one. Second one is social resources. So that's support from friends and family. Um, that can be particularly true of parents um, who, you know, especially single parents, you know, looking after kids takes a lot of time. And it's also true of older people um, who might have money and might have a kitchen that works, but um, might not be able to cook for themselves or might struggle to get to the shops. Um, health, mental and physical health, as particularly motivation, that's a huge one. Um, are people in a place where they can learn a new skill? Are they in a place where they can sort of manage not just budgeting, but also sort of cooking, which means you have to like think of something to cook, go to the shop and buy the ingredients, come back, have the energy to cook the ingredients. It takes quite a lot, so that's a big one. Um, knowledge, knowing how to cook, knowing how to budget, knowing where the food is sold in the supermarket and where the cheaper food is sold. So supermarkets are really overwhelming places. You can have all the you know big bright colors and expensive things shown at you. Um, and it's hard to like find out where the cheaper, more affordable stuff is and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of people can find them quite overwhelming. Time, that one's obvious. Do you have time to cook and eat? That's a big one. Do you have time to go to the shops? Do you have time for all this stuff? And physical infrastructure. So that's the infrastructure inside your house. Do you have adequate cooking facilities? Do you have a fridge? Do you have a freezer? Do you have a microwave? Blah, blah, blah. And can you access shops? Um, can you access shops? Is there a bus? Do you have a car? Um, all those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I would say with each of these, um, they can obviously be tackled in different ways. And even if someone you're talking to has maximized their income, so they're not entitled to any more money, might be like, okay, do they have any friends and family that they could talk to and say, oh, you know, are you doing a big shop? Could we do it together? Or could my kids go around your house once a week and then swap or something like that to save some time or to save some resources? Um, and your MEC training, if you do that, which I really recommend, that will really help with these things. Um, because if someone comes to you and says, oh, I, you know, I'm struggling with food, you can say, okay, well, how did you used to get food? Who used to help you? Who have you asked before? All those kind of prompts to help people think through the resources they have, which might not be financial, but maybe their community resources or something else like that. Um, and yeah, um, you can also recommend people to other mental health services or um, help them like work out where the buses are, or um, help them with a little guide to supermarkets and how to spot the cheapest things and that kind of stuff, um, which can sound simple, but can be really helpful. Next slide. Okay, yeah, this is a kind of a summary of what was on the last slide. So um, yeah, this is kind of a different way to phrase it. So do people have enough money to buy food without worry? I think that without worry is really important if people sort of can generally afford food, but they're not really secure about that. That stress can be particularly difficult. Um, do they have facilities to buy, store and prepare food? Yeah. Do they have time? Do they know what they're doing? And are they well enough to prepare food? And by that, I mean sort of the mental health and physical health. So are they physically able to prepare food? Can they stand up for long enough? Can they hold all the equipment? This is my OT training coming in. Um, can they sort of sequence the events to make a meal? Um, are they confident enough? Are they motivated? Um, and I've outlined there at the bottom, what I think is the most important one, do they have a network of people who can help them? I think with any problem that anyone has, having friends and family to help is the biggest asset and resource. And your MEC training will, like I said, encourage you to point people towards relying on friends and family, which is the best resource. Next slide. Food ladders. OK, this sounds a bit complicated. It's not. Essentially, the biggest takeaway from the food ladders theory I want you to have is that um, if someone is in crisis, they're not going to go to cooking lessons. So <laughs> if someone needs food now, like their cupboards are empty, they're really stressed, they need food now, that's it. 
there's no, you know, they're not going to benefit from budgeting. They're not going to benefit from cooking lessons. They're not going to benefit from help to get around a supermarket. They need food help. So that's the bottom rung. Um, the middle rung, capacity building. So someone might, you know, be struggling with their finances. Maybe their fridge is broken or their freezer is broken. Um, and they might benefit from a bit of training. So yeah, cooking lessons might be great for them. Or you could help them apply for a grant to replace some white goods. Or maybe they've fallen out with a friend, you could help them reconnect, or maybe they've stopped going to church, you could help them reconnect with that. All of these things that sort of help them get more secure, but they're not in crisis. So they have food in their cupboards right now, they know what they're gonna eat this evening and tomorrow. So that's the middle rung. Um, and people in the middle rung, like I say, can benefit from those things, don't need crisis, but could fall to crisis. So that's the middle rung. Then we've got the top rung. People on the top rung, uh, pretty secure with their food, they know what they're eating tomorrow, they know how to cook, they have their white goods, um, but maybe you could strengthen their, particularly their social network, by encouraging them to get involved in food projects. So maybe they could help run cooking lessons, or they could help teach others what they've learned, or they could um, get involved with cooking a community project, maybe they get a bit of free or local food through that, but they also meet people, they build links that they might then rely on should they fall down the ranks. So there's a few different ranks. And I think as a social prescriber, when you're looking to help someone, think about these two elements you need to think about. In what way are they food insecure and where are they on the food ladder? Because those that will affect the kind of um, things that you offer them. And like I said, MEC training will help you to identify all of that in your conversations. Next slide. Yeah, here we are. So here's some examples of how you could, um, different ways you could help people. Um, and like I said, the biggest takeaway, if you remember none of this, is that someone in crisis cannot benefit from cooking lessons. You have to solve the crisis first. Um, yeah, and I guess second most important takeaway, um, it's always valuable to help someone strengthen their social connections because that is the most valuable resource that they have. Um, I think that's it, unless there's one more slide. Let's see if there's one more slide. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. I was Louise, um, I'm gonna hang around if there's any more questions and I think it's breakout groups next. Hi everybody, thanks for um, thanks for staying along for that. We are actually running on time, which is great. I am gonna stop oh, stop sharing my screen briefly. How is everyone? I hope you've got, you've got a couple more minutes. We've got some time now for questions. So if anyone would like to put any questions in the chat, if not, we're going to move forward into the breakout rooms. Or if you'd like to just maybe have a think about any questions, you can let us know. But I am actually going to, I think I'm going to stop the recording now. So.